Oh, just some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Welcome to a vacant episode of All Things Horror. I am your host, Ben, and I'm joined here with my co-host, Matt. If you're new to the show, each week we choose a movie to break down and review. We give it our honest opinions and rate it from 1 to 10. We have a brief spoiler-free chat about the movie before heading into the plot and discuss our favourite and least favourite parts of the film. And if you stick around until the very end, we'll finish off with some interesting trivia and a fun little horror game created by myself. This week we are going to be discussing Psycho from 1960. And if by any chance you don't know this movie or know what it's about, it's about a woman who goes on the run after stealing some money from her employer. People try and find her and end up reaching the infamous Bates Motel, where they meet Mama's boy, Norman Bates. It is directed and produced by Alfred Hitchcock, with main cast as Janet Lee, uh, Anthony Perkins, John Gavin, and Vera Miles, with a runtime of one hour and 49 minutes. Yeah, first off, happy uh, 50th episode. <laughs> I feel 50, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's creeping up on me. We had to do uh we had to do a very like well respected episode for this one, I think. So oh. yeah, I was shocked we haven't actually done this one yet. No, uh, it's really strange because I was going on a bit of a psycho um retrospective and watching well, I'm up to the fourth one. I've still not got a chance to watch the fourth one again. Um, just because the last time I'd watched them all was I'd rented them all from the video shop, so it was a while. <laughs> uh, I have seen Cy- the original Psycho since then, but I hadn't seen two, three, and four for a long time. Yeah. Um, two was as good as I remember it being. I think it's really good. Three, slightly less, and four, I seem to remember thinking it was okay, but I think it was like a TV movie. Right. Okay. Um, but uh, have you seen the sequels as well? I haven't. I haven't. No. Uh, I really want to. Uh, I think we've spoken about it before because I. I was under the impression that the sequels weren't that good, but from what I've heard from you and other people, they've actually said that Psycho 2 is actually one of the better sequels that have been made. Yeah, it's funny that I think people are starting to come around to it a bit more now. I, I, I don't think I think it was just kind of seen as okay. It was written by um, the same guy who wrote um fright night whose name escapes me oh tom holland oh, okay uh, not that one not not <laughs> um and uh it's it, it, it's more of a character study into norman and his treatment after the first right so like kind of trying to do the things that the psychiatrists teach him and trying to stick to those rules and behaviors and sort of fighting with his inner demons so it's it's definitely more of a character study of norman Mm. i didn't realize how long it takes to get to norman in the first psycho like okay yeah yeah is it i in my head from the last couple of times i've seen it it gets to the hotel a lot quicker Mm. Mm. but in this last time i watched it i was like wow there's lots of build-up about her you know the money and everything and Janet Lee and yeah I was thinking the exact same thing actually I mean I've only seen this like a small handful of times but I was mm. thinking the exact same thing like the first half uh, it didn't it didn't drag like I wasn't bored no. it, it was interesting like I do like yeah. watching it with the whole well we'll get we'll get into it. I don't want to spoil it but yeah it is quite interesting in what happens but 
I definitely remembered getting to the Bates Motel a lot sooner last time I watched yeah. it. It's so weird. It is so weird. I was, I, that was the, that was like the big thing that sort of stuck in my mind about it. This, I was like, oh wow, mm. like because maybe because over time of not watching it, you think to yourself, this is all about Norman. This is his film, um, but it isn't really. It, it, it's more her and her family's and the people looking for her's film, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's only that I think Anthony Perkins does such a great job. And obviously in the sequels, every moment of the film are about um are all about um Norman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like maybe then you go back and you, you forget. It's a bit like when a character is more popular than they anticipate and then they make the sequels more about that character. Mm-hmm. I'm trying yeah. to think of a good example of that, but I can't off the top of my head. But there's quite a few where someone's become a bit of a cult character. Or, or say, for example, like making a Boba Fett TV series because everyone just thought Boba Fett was really cool, even though in the films, the original film, he doesn't really say very much. Mm, yeah, that's true. It's a bit like that. But I guess Norman is is a iconic character in the first one, don't get me wrong. But yeah, we don't get to him very quickly at all. I'm always stunned, like every time I watch this, I'm always stunned that how much of a great job Anthony Perkins did as Norman Bates. Like, I'm, oh, yeah. I mean, everyone's great in this film, but he, you really believe him. I, I, yeah. It's just, it's not only like his acting, it's like everything about what he's doing, he is that character. It's incredible. Yeah. He really yeah, put himself I, into I that really... mindset. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I think Anthony Perkins, as an actor, is such an interesting... I'd recommend anyone to do any reading on him because he spent his whole life fighting with his sexuality. Um, and that trauma and struggle and internal uh, fight within himself, I think, makes him the perfect Norman Bates. Mm, okay. And when they firstly made him... Uh, when he first kind of went from being a stage actor to a screen actor, they were pushing him as a new James Dean, <laughs> a kind of tortured teen, handsome, you know, girls are going to love him. And they definitely did because they thought he seemed very non-threatening and sensitive and quite gentle, N you know, not kind of the uh, the machismo of a Marlon Brando or someone like that, uh, kind of somewhere between Brando and James Dean. But he didn't like that portrayal and i think as much as he didn't like that idea of being a teen idol i think he had to get used to the fact that he, once he did norman bates he was always going to play characters like norman bates right yeah 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 um would you <laughs> is this, would you consider this the first uh, slasher um well I think Hitchcock's well known for um, being a real student of what sells well. So I think that there's, you know, some maybe some French Italian films that possibly influenced um, the making of this. Mm. It's just that Hitchcock did it better. You know, it's a bit like we were saying about, you know, um, Bob Clark and doing Black Christmas and doing a lot of the things that you see in Halloween, but it's just, I don't know, just maybe not do it better, but just sort of more efficiently and more eye-catching. And I guess it is better in a lot of ways. It's just sort of, I don't know, like Halloween and Psycho compared to, say, um, Black Christmas and, and, and um other films of, of, of before around the time of Psycho, there's just something about the filmmaking that is just so studied and well well executed. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. that I think makes it so good. So I don't know. I'm sure there'll have been other things that we could classify as slashes, but I think in terms of making the, the, the actual act of slashing someone and the knife, because I'm thinking, I'm trying to think if any of... Um, Italian filmmakers uh, like Barva and people like that, you know, that whether they were doing things like this before, 
and, and off the top of my head i'm not sure but in terms of north american cinema even though like obviously hitchcock's um not american um you still this is this is what popularized it and maybe started that genre do you think yeah i'm i'll be honest i'm not too familiar when it when it goes kind of back this far i'm not i'm not really a huge lover of black and white movies in in general but um however i do i do tend to like forget quite quickly as soon as i start watching it if i like my one of my favorite all-time films is creature from the black lagoon and and that's an old what's that like late 40s 50s um but that's such a great film and as soon as i put it on i remember oh yeah it's in black and white five ten minutes in i'm i've just completely forgotten and it's the same every time i watch this it's like i put it on give me 10 minutes i'm just i'm fully into it like nice of the living dead you know yeah as, as well like that that doesn't need to be in color even though you'd think oh it's a zombie film yeah, da, da, da. yeah. it doesn't need to be but the thing is i i always have in my head that i see a black and white film i'm like oh it's just because it's so old but that wasn't really the case for this one, though, was it? Like, I think Alfred Hitchcock actually made it black and white on purpose because I think his movie before was in colour. Yeah, uh, it's right? interesting because, you know, sometimes people make films out of black and white because of the cost and necessity, like Clerks or right, yeah. things like that, In you know, in, in the late in the mid-90s. Obviously, there was colour in the mid-90s, but actually somehow ends up being seen as more of an artistic statement mm, yeah um, i'm not sure why that is uh, i guess because we look at black and white films as being classics so yeah. instantly gives something a sort of classic approach i mean to to go back to what we were saying about where the origin of this that i think this is very there's so many people are influenced all the way up to um texas chainsaw massacre and beyond i think ed gein is the is the is the kind of the the, the touch point for this and mm -hmm. robert block when he wrote this was living not that far away from where ed gein was arrested oh, okay All right. so i think there's a bit of that that apparently what captured the imagination of ed of um of ed gein, of uh, robert block <laughs> was that that the neighbors all in the local news said there was such a Puritan family, like so well behaved and yeah. so like correct. And that he heard about this woman's suit. So I guess this gave him the idea rather than a film. But in terms of obviously then Alfred Hitchcock will have been like, you know, this sounds this book, this book looks great. I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? Who gives people the books to read like is it their family their friends their yeah. agents are they passed around in hollywood and then they go oh i'm gonna make that into a film like who gave spielberg or the studio <laughs> the copy of jaws or who gave how did that copy of psycho get into alfred hitchcock's hands that's really interesting because obviously some people just some companies just buy them up don't they and just buy up all the books that sound interesting or successful books yeah. and get the rights to them. And they don't always make it into films. But I, yeah, I didn't even know this was based on a book. I mean, I, other than when I was doing my research, research, it said it was based on a book by Robert Block. Is that a book of the same name? Was the book called yeah, uh, Psycho? Yeah, and, and he wrote a Psycho 2 and he wrote Psycho House. But Psycho 2 book and Psycho House and not nothing like the films. The films kind of follow more what Anthony Perkins wants to do, I think. Right. I think he's got the power to kind of say, well, I'm going to go this way with Norman and kind of take Norman the way he wanted him to go. So, like, the first... The film is similar to the first book, but beyond that, I think Block doesn't really have much to do with it. Um, hmm. And other people have kind of... you know, You know, like, how you have people who... May write new James Bond books, but they're obviously not Ian Fleming. Um, I think there's a fourth Robert Block bait, Robert Block influenced psycho book, um, that came out in the 2000s sometime. But I've only read the first one, I know that the second and third books are nothing like the second and third films, <laughs> so that's interesting. It goes off in two different directions. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I'm interested in how. 
Hitchcock got there um, and, and how he decided to make it. But like you say, deciding to do it in black and white gives it a real classic look, you oh, know, going yeah. all the way back yeah. to Nosferatu. They're, they're certainly scary films because they're in black and white. So is this, this has never been colorized, has it? No, they did do a shot for shot remake with Vince Vaughn in color and right. Gus Van Sant did. And I saw that and I just thought, what's the point? Yeah, because I have seen pictures online, um, not not of that one, like of this one, but I think it's just like freeze frames where they've colorized like certain right. shots of it. Yeah, or maybe they had, um, they even, took on set photos. Yeah, even my uh, DVD, the front cover is a. Uh, Janet Lee and she's in colour on that one. Yeah. So yeah, I did have that. I actually had that one, or maybe I had one that had that and Rear Window on it. Um, since then, I don't know what's happened to those, and I've ended up with like a, a box set of the four Psycho films on them. <laughs> I do, I, I do like Rear Window. I think Rear Window might be my favourite hmm. um, Alfred Hitchcock film. Uh, Psycho, I, I do like. Um, I, but I have a, such a soft spot for Psycho too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is just typical, really, I suppose. Considering it, you know, it's 1983, uh, sorry, 1982, um, when Psycho 2 comes out. So there's been a big gap. But you forget how young Anthony Perkins is. Yeah. You know, in this original film, he's he's so young. And then he's still relatively young in the sequels. I mean, he only pa- he passed away when he was 60, so he wasn't... Oh, okay. You know, he wasn't uh, around a long time, but he he did a lot, you know, he achieved a lot. Yeah. Well, it was definitely had uh, huge, like, influences on other horror movies, and like I've mentioned before, like, my all-time favourite film, um, well, it's definitely in my top five, but I would, I would say Scream is one of my top favourite ones, and uh, mm. that film alone even had quite a few references to this film i mean the uh what one of the guys um, i don't want to spoil scream for anyone but one of the guys from scream is is called loomis and like in this film you have sam loomis and even one of the uh guys in the film says the iconic quote we all go a little mad sometimes um so yeah i i, I can imagine there's a lot of movies i mean screams meta so they can literally just call it out but there, I would imagine there's so many films that have just taken aspects or just like, oh yeah, given them the road to just make a film from this film. Like, there's a lot you can do of it, and, and like you said earlier, that um, Ed Gein, it it was li- yeah. well loosely based on Ed Gein and his life, but so was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and also uh, the hill, uh, not the Hills of Eyes, um. The Silence of the Lambs, that was also based, based on... There's so much of, like, wearing someone else or dressing up as someone else, um, like males dressing up as females and females dressing up as males and, you know, blimey, even do that in Scooby-Doo. But, um, <laughs> like, this, there's nothing more scary than Norman Bates dressed up because it's such a, he's, it's such a shock. But I think it's that is really influential, and I wonder if like that's the side of it that um, that Anthony Perkins really attached to himself to the idea of pretending to be someone you're not. Yeah. Um, you know, he he's somebody who experienced um, going through like a, the gay conversion therapy and things like that, and believed that it worked. And if you think like that's the ultimate of convincing yourself you're someone else Hmm. um or not being happy with who you are or fighting who you are so he plays this like it's him it feels like it's him you only see the difference like if you're doing a shot for shot of this film colorizing it you'd think it'd be a better film or it'd be you know a really really powerful great film but with vince vaughn who's totally miscast um vince vaughn instead of um um, Anthony Perkins it's a completely different film it just shows you how strong the center even though like we say he doesn't turn up yeah that much and Janet Lee and you know her her lineage to you know obviously um Jamie Lee Curtis and you know all these things but like I think the big thing that tips it over into being an absolute classic film is that that central performance of um of Anthony Perkins and he 
he is he's just so instantly that character that of course you want it, it seems strange that there was such a gap between that and a sequel but maybe just didn't want to touch it and it's hard because you're not going to improve on it mm. which is, mm. which is another another tricky one did anthony perkins did he not get any uh, awards or anything because i know janet lee got an, an oscar and i think she got a golden globe as well that's a really good question and i don't know i i have a feeling that he didn't get any any uh, not for this film anyway mm, um, that's a shame yeah it's it, it, it's again there is a little bit of a you know if you're an overtly horrific character i suppose there's anthony perk uh, yeah anthony hopkins who's managed to kind of cross that and play sort of horrific characters and still get awards mm. But um, I'll tell you who would be really good, and this is just completely digressing, if they were to remake it maybe 10 years ago, maybe maybe longer, would have been um, Andrew Garfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he looks would, like Anthony yeah, Perkins. Would, I reckon he would he, do a good job. He has that. Mm. There we go. <laughs> yeah, that, that, if we're fantasy casting, like he's got that kind of sensitivity and gentleness about him. It's funny because Perkins said that the biggest in influence on him was Marlon Brando, and that was the direction he wanted <laughs> to go in, to to like use very small movements to convey the most. But it just didn't have that same masculinity, that same aggression as, because he's not like a scary. Norman Bates isn't a scary character, no, is he? I was going to say you don't really want that, really. No. <laughs> no, it wouldn't work if he was like a badass. That film wouldn't work. Hmm. I was gonna. Say, I was just wondering who would be good to play Janet Lee, but then I mm. think uh, a few years ago, or it might have been the anniversary for this, uh, Jamie Lee reenacted the shower scene. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe Carrie Mulligan would be good. I think, or mm. Saoirse Ronan, someone like that who's quite sort of looks like they're kind of quite distinct features and, and quite, pl you know, not plain, but like um, scrubbed, like well scrubbed kind yeah, of yeah. <laughs> classic look. Um, oh, cool. they, they, I think they struggled. They tried to bring somebody in similar to her in Psycho 3 um, and it doesn't quite, I think she's good. I can't remember who it was now, but um, yeah, she was okay. But I see what they were trying to do. It's hard to it's hard to have that kind of character who's doing something wrong, but she still comes across as quite prim and proper as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely need to watch Psycho too. Maybe we could do that for sequel September. I really want to. Yeah, really want to watch that. Well, <laughs> as they go along, her sister keeps um, reappearing. I think it's Gene Simmons who plays her sister. It becomes more and more irritating <laughs> as the series goes on. Doesn't have a lot to do in the original one. It becomes more, more and more irritating. <laughs> um, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, if Perkins has played shy, gawky, twitchy, um, I think that's probably, from what I've read, what he was actually like anyway <laughs> at that age and that time of his life. So. It just shows you how important casting is, isn't it, to to, to pulling something off, no matter mm. how great the director or the um, story is. Yeah, I can believe it. Um, mm. Right, uh, should we now jump into the plot and go through this film? Mm -hmm. And we'll hear that. Spoiler warning. Spoiler warning. <laughs> right, so... The movie starts off with our main girl, Marion Crane. She works as a real estate secretary, and after hearing um, her boyfriend complain about his debts, that's kind of like delaying his marriage, uh, she decides to steal 40 grand in cash from her employer. Marion then sets off to drive to California, and on the way she switches cars after she encounters a suspicious policeman. Um, <laughs> during a heavy rainstorm, though, she stops off at the Bates Motel and she's greeted by Norman Bates. And after settling in, he offers to make her some food and to join her in his office. 
Uh, when Norman returns uh, to his house to retrie- retrieve the food, Marion hears him arguing with his mother. And uh, Marion suggests that Norman should put his mother in an institution, but he becomes quite offended by that. And that's when he says the uh, the all-famous all quote. We all go a little mad sometimes. <laughs> Marion returns to her room. She gets undressed while Peeping Norman has a cheeky look through the hole in the wall. Peeping Norman. (laughs) And then uh, while she's having a shower, a big shadowy female figure enters the bathroom and stabs her to death. Yeah, the, uh, the famous shower scene, as everyone knows it. Yeah, that's her. That's... That shower scene, do you know that that's reported to have taken, like, 70 different camera angles? And it only lasts for, like, 45 seconds. (laughs) I think that makes a lot of sense because the cuts are so... uh, so well done, so well thought out that they look perfect. Like, they are one of the most scary things ever put on on camera yeah. which is pretty amazing to think how they did it and the thought and time and care that went into it that doesn't surprise me i didn't know the exact number but that doesn't surprise me at all yeah i think i've got it in the trivia somewhere how how long they spent on that one specific scene but yeah apparently oh. apparently it was what was it like 70 yeah 70 different camera angles and shots taken just to do that that quick 45 second clip in the film wow yeah and obviously it works <laughs> yeah and obviously we haven't even spoken about the score like that that score just yeah, yeah. makes that scene well that score is something that in one way or another you hear all the time in mm. horror films it's not maybe not exactly the same one but if you look at say reanimator with richard band yeah. You know, anytime anyone, it's almost like shorthand for what um, a psychological horror sounds like, even from when we watch Malignant um, through to, like I say, all the, <laughs> and pretty much anything Richard Band did for, for, for uh, Full Moon or for Reanimator, uh, Empire Pictures, all of those. Mm. The music is, you're right to highlight that because the music is incredibly evocative and fits perfectly with all the actions but the characters it's subtle it's powerful yeah it's just yeah. it's just smashing yeah. isn't it and the weird thing is they took a chance in the sequels with young um young composers um and went in the completely almost the completely opposite direction of um the original psycho so i guess they're trying not to just copy it. But then so many people did just copy it, didn't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Every, I mean, everyone knows it. Everyone knows yeah. that scene. Everyone knows that score. And um, I thought I had it written down here, but I don't. Um, I can't remember the guy who did the score for it. I don't suppose you know. Oh, so that's um, Bernard Herman or Bernard yeah, Herman. Oh, yeah, that's the one, yeah. Um, and he didn't want to do it. No. No, because it wasn't enough money. Like It wasn't a big... Well, um, I, I think film. after they agreed that he would do it and it got to that scene, Alfred Hitchcock didn't actually want anything. He didn't want a score over that. And oh. he, uh, um, was it Herman? Yeah. He uh, he really fought to do that because he, he had the idea in his head. He had the vision of how it would go down and he really fought for it. And then Alfred he was like, yeah, okay, all right, let's do it. And then after they watched it back with the score over the top alfred hitchcock actually um doubled his uh his his pay for it right interesting because that's again it's like a perfect storm isn't it you just get the right people involved yeah. and they they make it better even sometimes if it's what you think isn't the best thing to do like it was like you say <laughs> hitchcock was like no i'm not going to do that but he's clever enough to say oh well, actually mm. um we're gonna, you know, we're gonna go. We, we will do it. We'll do it your way. That works better than what I originally thought. Mm. And, and he, yeah, because he didn't do the second. It was Jerry Goldsmith, 
Um, even though they tried to get John Williams, they didn't manage it. And the third one, which I think is really interesting, is I see called Carter Burwell, who who's like a very well known, um, uh, very well known composer now. But at the time, I think it was his first, his first ever, and not and because um, it was directed by Anthony Perkins, I believe. Yeah. The third one, that. Um, he was like, no, we're going to go a complete. Yeah, Carter Burwell. He's he's going to he was going to go a completely different way, and then Burwell's gone on to do all the scores for the Coen Brothers films. <laughs> so like, it's amazing, really, how the music is so important. But it's that initial. He, he it's not like he went on and did another twenty films that sounded exactly like Psycho because he didn't. No, and he didn't even do the sequels. Yeah. Um... Going back to the scene before that, when Marion's actually on her way to the Bates Motel, there, there's something I find really clever. Like when she's driving, like she's hearing all the like all the voices that from mm. everyone talking about her, like her boss and her co-workers and Sam, people talking about Marion, like where she is and what she's done, what she's up to. Now I wasn't sure if if that's what was actually being said or like for the viewers watching it that's actually what's going down right now or if that's what she's thinking and that's what's going through her head amidst like oh. all the paranoia in her head because you don't really need to include all those scenes in the movie of people asking where she is you know i feel this is a much clever way of doing it because you're cutting off all the fat but you're still getting that and you can kind of make your own decision on how you view it i think it works either way don't know how how would you take that? That's a really good point. Like, yeah, the, I think maybe the idea is to to it to, for it to be quite ambiguous. Like, is it what she's thinking? I think my initial thought was it's what's going on while she's on the drive. Right. But then, like you say, it almost makes it more interesting for it to be what she's thinking. They are talking about her while she's not around. Like, you know, or what's her, like can because she's a never done anything bad in her life she's going to be well other than having an affair mm. um she's 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 going to be like um what are they thinking of me or what are they saying about me yeah so maybe it's a combination of the two and and probably it's probably a good thing that we don't know yeah <laughs> yeah no i just thought that was quite clever and that's interesting yeah. because i thought the other way of you yours that, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so yeah shortly after norman comes to check on Marion and he discovers her dead body. He cleans up the murder scene, puts her body in the car with all uh, with all her belongings and then sinks the car in the swamp. Marion's sister Lila goes to see Sam and and there's also a private investigator Nate oh god how do you say his name Ar Arbogast <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Arbogast. Arbogast. Yeah. <laughs> That's such um such an old fashioned kind of character name. <laughs> <laughs> um he goes to the Bates Mattel and questions Norman and then Norman he's he's really nervous behaviour and he starts being really inconsistent with his with his answers and it's kind of arousing suspicion. So um he checks the guest register and discovers the, from that her handwriting Marion was there and she used a different name um, Norman said that Marion had spoke to his mother but when he asked to speak to her mother Norman refuses and pretty much just asks him to like to leave and then after he enters the Bates home because he did go over there in the end well after he gets in you see Norman's mother or you who you'd think is Norman's mother uh, she emerges from the bedroom and then stabs him to death and he falls down the stairs hmm that was cool I, I did it's it's a kind of a weird camera shot when he's falling down the stairs isn't it? I'm not quite sure how they achieved that it's like a very close up on his face like as he's like falling backwards it's interesting yeah it makes you wonder obviously the you know the first Obviously, the, the, um, Alfred Hitchcock's films are, are such a visual feast, particularly for the time. Mm. Um, it makes you wonder, like, 
how collaborative he is because like we just said how collaborative he was on the um on the on the sound on the on the um the score yeah like particularly that moment because if he hadn't have listened it'd have been very different shower scene wouldn't it yeah yeah um so it's interesting i wonder how much of a singular um a singular vision it is in the in the visual side as well did he listen to ideas or did he kind of sit there and say this is what i want it to look like go ahead and do it you know um yeah it does feel i'd love to be there on this on the um on the set oh, and definitely. watching make of these films yeah it does feel like every single piece of this movie was so incredibly thought out because it's, yes. it's not just the score it's not just the acting but it's also like the camera angles like this when he falls down the stairs and the shots of the house and everything everything you see and john john russell who's the cinematographer like when you look at what he did like he didn't do much of any note other than this oh really oh okay. so that mainly tv stuff he did a lot of the alfred hitchcock presents mm. um series he did um a remake of the cabinet of dr caligari he did mainly TV, like I say, mainly TV stuff. I think um, I think that was a budget thing as well, wasn't it? Like Alfred mm, couldn't afford the budget he wanted, so he kept it quite low and used people he already had connections yeah. with. So it's not like an Oscar-winning cinematographer. I, I guess is my point. I suppose that mm. it's just like you said, who he can, who he knew, and who he could get hold of. Like the editing. Um, George Tomasini, again, a bit different because he did edit together Marnie and the Birds and Cape Fear, the Misfits, North by Northwest, Vertigo, um, <laughs> Rear Window. So he's he's got a bit more of a pedigree for editing than the cinematographer did. But I'd imagine that when it comes to the way it looks, Hitchcock was like a ringmaster yeah 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 like one small detail i liked which stood out to me was norman knew nothing about the money that she hid away and you see her like she kind of she's getting so paranoid by this money she keeps moving it from place to place and then she like ends up wrapping it up in a newspaper so when he's cleaning up her body and all the mess like he just kind of like grabs it and chucks it in the car and then obviously that gets dumped in the swamp but I can't help but wonder what would have happened like if he did discover the money and like all that cash. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm he, going to Disneyland. See yeah. you later, mother. <laughs> like he'd already <laughs> mentioned like a couple of times already that um, he gets no customers, so I'm sure he's probably desperate for the money. So I don't know. I just yeah, couldn't yeah, help but think about it. Yeah, how much money mattered to him? Yeah, I, I always got that impression. Like he, like he. It's the last thing on his mind, even in the sequels and stuff, and people are there, and like, um, you know, oh, we've got some. He almost seemed a bit fed up when they got people in the hotel, mm, mm. <laughs> where it liked it nice and quiet and nice and, you know, remote, and people maybe not going to kind of uh, disturb him. Maybe that's because he thinks at any given moment he's going to do something terrible. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Less chance of getting caught when there's no one there. Yeah. So, yeah, we're now towards the final act. And Sam goes to the motel to look for him. He sees a figure in the window who he assumes is Norman's mother. But after talking to the local sheriff, the sheriff tells him that Norman's mother died ten years ago. <laughs> Surprise! Uh, well, it definitely is. Um, definitely is a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam and uh, Lila they go back to the motel, and Sam distracts Norman whilst Lila sneaks into the house. Lila ends up going down into the cellar, where she discovers the mummified body of Norman's mother, and then Lila screams in horror, and Norman wearing women's clothes and a wig he enters the cellar and tries to stab her but sam then stops him and at the police station a psychiatrist explains that norman killed his mother and her mother's lover 10 years ago 
earlier out of jealousy. Unable to bear with the guilt, he mummified his mama's corpse and began treating it as if she were still alive. Uh, creating his mother as an alternate personality. As Norman sits in, in a jail cell, a psychiatrist concludes that Mother has now submerged Norman's personality and Marion's car, which contained her remains and the stolen money, is retrieved from the swamp. Yeah. That swamp is um, holding a, hiding a multitude of sins. <laughs> yeah. So I think it also revealed that there was a couple more people before Marion. Is that right? Like he he he'd already killed a couple of people before him. I, I don't. Yes, I think that's the impression. I mean, I feel like that's his answer to everything: mm. is just <laughs> kill people and put them in the swamp. Um, and then the irony being, like a lot of the times, without giving any spoils to anything, the police come along, take stuff out of the swamp, and I'm like Norman, do you know anything about these cars and people in the swamp? And he's like, no, that's a complete <laughs> surprise to me. And they're like, yep, seems legit. Bye, Norman. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder how much like that plays out to like the real like Ed Gein, because I think it's like a small town and everyone in the town yep. kind of just saw him as a regular normal guy, just a little yeah, bit Yeah, very prim and proper and well-to-do family and... Yeah. Yeah, they kind of feel sorry for Norman, I think, as well. In it's because of, like the locals do, because of losing his mother, mm. um, they don't necessarily look too much into the details of that losing of the mother. They're just like, well, it's just a terrible circumstance, you know. He's he's harmless because yeah. you only have to meet him to know he's harmless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, if I met him, I'd think he was harmless. I mean, say that no, I wouldn't. I would think with someone like that, there's always the potential for something to go off. I met somebody this weekend. Who I, I don't know. It was like a complete stranger on the train. And yeah, wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. <laughs> he was chatting away to me, perfectly friendly. But when I looked at his eyes and looked at his mannerisms, I was like, I'm going to take a step back here. <laughs> and I think that's what Norman's like. If you know people like that, if you have a sense of, um, not distrust, but if you have an understanding of how mental health works and how people can be pushed to their limits, mm. then you don't just innocently go like, oh, hi, Norman, how's it going? Blah, 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 and completely ignore those little indicators yeah yeah what the people in the people in the town do because they're all quite you know simple regular and and kind of un and trusting innocent people where in a small town where not much bad stuff happens mm. cool man uh let's go ahead and rate this film so one to ten what are we doing one to ten Mama's boys, <laughs> yeah, wigs, um... <laughs> wigs, <laughs> yeah. Go on then. Uh, what what are you gonna give it? One to ten. This was the hardest one I think I've had to do because in terms of cinematic history, it's a ten. Mm. But like, I I don't. I'm not like. It's not like a film I go back and watch all the time. I think it's a wonderful, well-made film. Um. So I'm going to go for a 9 out of 10. Ooh. Well, I was thinking of 8.5, but I went for now. Yeah, I I was exactly the same as you. I I was thinking an 8.5 and I ended up on a 9. <laughs> <laughs> because it just it deserves it. Like yeah. It's such a legendary film. Like Anthony Perkins, he absolutely just drives this movie, and I can't really picture someone else playing Norman Bates better than him. Um, you know, I'm not saying that the other actors are bad, but you can tell they were acting. Whereas Anthony Perkins, like he really became that role, and he got into it so well, like you can believe him completely. Like, so that in itself, like the movie and how the movie is, like. I would have gave it an 8.5. However, I got more respect for it from 
the the camera angles and and the score i don't think anything has come remotely close to this film until they made jaws and even then i would argue that this is a better film than jaws like you can tell how everything has just been so carefully planned out so yeah i, I had a much better time watching it this time around viewing and paying attention to all the small little details and appreciating it for what it is so yeah i'm with you i'm giving it a nine nine out of ten oh, strange yeah <laughs> <laughs> i've got a little bit of trivia so let's do some trivia Oh, yeah. uh, so, director Alfred Hitchcock, he, he bought the rights to the novel like anonymously from Robert Bloch for, mm. for nine grand. Um, and then after he did that, he then bought up as many copies of the novel as he could in order to keep the ending a secret. Huh. <laughs> That's, That's so good. Um... When the cast and crew began work on the first day, they had to raise their right hands and swear an oath not to divulge one word of the story to anyone. Alfred Hitchcock also uh, withheld the ending of the script uh, from all the cast until he actually needed to shoot it. That's pretty cool. I think some... some uh, that's, that's not uncommon now, is it? I think we've spoken about that a few times. I think... Who did we do lately... Was it Wes Craven? Someone. It might have been Scream. Yeah, Scream. Mm. It might have been Scream. Yeah, they didn't want any, the uh, ending spoiled. Yeah. It's harder these days as well. Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Digital footprint of everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, the knife, uh, the, the shot of the knife that appears to enter Marion's abdomen, that was achieved by pressing it really hard against her body, so, like, it dented the skin... And then they withdrawed it rapidly, and then they just shot it backwards, so it looked like it was going the other way. Oh wow! Again, hmm. again, I think we've spoken about that as well, like reverse filming quite a few times on the pod. Like you don't really see it as much now, but it was very popular technique back then. Yeah, and, and I really, I really uh, respect that. I think it's it's good. Uh, it's good. It's good. It's good work how they can manage well, to. If that. you like that, then the Stuart Ashen has got a film on Kickstarter at the moment where the whole film is going to be filmed in reverse. Really? The whole film? Yeah. <laughs> a horror film as well. Um, so like the Ashen's channel on YouTube, and he's done a couple of films, mainly comedies, but this is his first horror. So, oh, wow. yeah, it's um, it's worth checking out Stuart Ashen and see how he, uh, how he does that. Cool. <laughs> oh, but that takes a lot of work. Of, mm, I think it's becoming. I think from the updates, it's more difficult than he thought. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, so Alfred Hitchcock tested the fear factor of Mother's corpse by placing it in Janet Lee's dressing room and listening to how loud she screamed <laughs> when she discovered it there. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Um, and lastly, Alfred Hitchcock, he has a cameo in this film. About five minutes into the movie, he can be seen as a man uh, wearing a cowboy hat standing outside of Marion's office. Um, Hitchcock said he wanted his cameo to be very early in the film, otherwise the audience would get distracted, constantly looking for his appearance. Mm. Yeah, there we go. And that's all I got for trivia. So let's now jump into this week's game. <laughs> Right, so this game, um, as Psycho is such a high-rated movie, I'm going to name some other like high-rated movies, and you've got to try and tell me if Rotten Tomatoes have given it a higher or lower score than Psycho. So Rotten Tomatoes have given this a 97%. Oh, okay. <laughs> 97%, and the first film up against it is Dracula. Um, lower. Oh, no. Wrong one. Oh, that was a that, that was that was a roller coaster of emotion. <laughs> it was low up, but Dracula was ninety four percent. 
So next up, another oldie, Rosemary's Baby. Uh, I'm still going to go, oh, actually, critically acclaimed, so I'm going to go higher. Oh, I was, overthought it. it My was... initial thought was lower. <laughs> I was going to go lower for everything. It was only 1% lower. It was 96%. Next up, I don't know if you've seen this. It's more of a newer type film, but The Babadook. Lower. I've not seen it. It's been on my list not. for a, as many years as it's been made. Yeah. No, surprisingly not. That's actually got a 98%. I, I know people like it. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I've, I've had opportunities to watch it a few times, just never done it. Never got around to it. <laughs> Don't know why. Uh, next up is The Omen. Oh, lower. Um, yep. No, Sorry. no. Got to... oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got my buttons all mixed up. I don't know what I'm doing. It made me cry. It was lower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Wicker Man. Uh, lower again. And lastly, The Bride of Frankenstein. Lower. Ah, yeah, that one was 98%. Wow, that is a good score. Ah. don't know how they work these out from... Yeah, I don't know. ...from donkeys years ago, but yeah. Surprisingly, Bride of Frankenstein is a higher rated film than Frankenstein. Mm. It's got a higher score. Interesting. Must be the hair. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. That is the whole episode. So just to wrap up, next oh. episode... Oh, who? Oh. So, no, I just thought while while we're talking Hitchcock. Oh yeah. Um, there is um so Amicus Studios who have kind of risen from the grave, are making a Hitchcock inspired film called Black Chariot. It's on Kickstarter at the moment. It looks really interesting. Oh. Um, Laurie Brewster, who um, I interviewed a while back, and he's a really cool guy. Um, Scottish chap. He'll he will be playing, um. Well, he'll be playing somebody called Laurie Hitchcock in the um in the film <laughs> but it's kind of in the old black and white style that we were just talking about but not oh. just that in the kind of um the spine tingling hitchcock style so yeah it's called black chariot about a haunted classic car with Ooh. lawrence harvey in it from um human centipede oh wow um, so yeah. yeah it should be interesting what's that one so that's currently, they're funding it on Kickstarter. If you type in Black Chariot and look at Laurie Brewster on there, um, they're, they're trying to raise for, it's not through Amicus, these other companies, it's through Hex Studios. Um, it's got a rat, I think they're looking for 50,000 to make it, and I think they've already, in a couple of days, already made about 20. So it's oh, going nice. pretty well. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll have a look at that. All right, for next episode, I was thinking The Burning. Ooh. It's been okay, a... like we, have we not done The Burning? No, No, we haven't. I think it was in a poll pick, but I can't remember what I think Friday the 13th beat it. So mm. never got George Costanza's in that one. Mm. It's uh, been a while. Uh, Jason Alexander uh, yes. from Seinfeld. <laughs> I've, got, I've, uh, I've got it on Blu-ray somewhere. I don't think I own it. I don't think I own it. I have the soundtrack briefly. But I was offered, um, I was given an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, oh, also I've put the poll pick up for this month, and this month the poll pick is going to be for the best zombie movie, Ooh. and that's out of the original Dawn of the Dead, the first Resident Evil, and Twenty Eight Days Later. Ooh. It's okay. um, it's. Because cause what I do is I put two poll picks up. I do the poll pick on Facebook and I do the poll pick on YouTube. And they are very much different from each other. On Facebook, no one wants Resident Evil. Fair Everyone enough. wants Dawn of the Dead and just a few people want 28 Days Later. Whereas on YouTube, 28 Days Later is winning and Dawn of the Dead's coming in second place. And some people want Resident Evil. See, so 28 Days Later would be a good one to see, as I know them, they're making a new one. So it would be nice to have a bit of a catch-up, because it's been so long since I've seen, yeah, yeah. seen that. 
Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, and that is everything for today. So unless you've got anything else, I'll see us out. No, oh, that's it. That was good fun. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm gonna go and um, put on a dress and just uh, go running around my village. <laughs> the Stabbing usual me. then. No, no, I'm not gonna do that. Standard Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. If you've liked today's episode and want to hear more, then go ahead and give us a follow on wherever you're listening from. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can vote for this month's poll pick there. And that's all for today. So thanks a lot for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. We all go a little mad sometimes.